Okay. Okay, welcome to uh, this very special uh, SOAS Center of Tower Studies um, uh, book launch. Um, today we're, we're going to be um, uh, launching the, um, the publication of uh, Migration uh, to and from Taiwan uh, that came out in uh, late December of, uh, of last year. But we wanted to wait for the launch, uh, wait until Isabel had fully recovered from, from childbirth, so we kind of delayed it um, a little bit. What we're trying to do in this uh, book um, is to look at how migration, both to and from Taiwan, uh, has really been transforming um, Taiwan's politics, uh, economics, uh, and society. We wanted to shed some light on some of the really um, amazing kind of trends that we, we've been seeing over the last couple of decades. And um, one of the things we had was that, um, to a large extent, the kind of mainstream literature on Taiwan, cross-strait relations, um, even domestic politics, was really neglecting um, uh, some of these really dynamic uh, trends. If we just think about some statistics, we could see, we'd get some sense of the way that uh, Taiwan has been uh, transformed. Just think, we've got a okay, we've got an adult population of something like uh, 18 million in Taiwan, um, and then on top of that, think about something like 1.5 to 2 million Taiwanese living and working um, in, in China. That's a, that's a huge proportion of the adult population. So that should have some significant um, political uh, implications. Similarly, if we think about migration uh, into Taiwan, we're looking at really uh, significant uh, numbers here. If we think, for example, about the numbers of um, contract workers, we're talking about something like um, half a million. Uh, the numbers of um, marriage uh, spouses. Again, if we bring in, the, uh, combine the numbers of um, mainland spouses and Southeast Asian spouses. Again, we're, we're talking in terms of um, half a million people. This this means that these kind of uh, some of these population groups are actually exceeding, uh, for example, the numbers of uh, Aboriginals or the number of first generation uh, mainlanders. It means that the uh, the standard uh, ethnic groupings that we think about when we think about um, uh, modern Taiwan, the Wai Shan Benson, Kejia, Yuan distinctions, need some revision because of these new uh, migration uh, groups. Um, in this book, um, what we try to do is to look at this issue of migration to and from Taiwan from a huge, from a very kind of diverse range of um, disciplinary uh, methods. If you look carefully through the index for this book, you can see we've got um, film studies people, education, sociology, social work, international relations, uh, political economy, um, anthrop anthropolo anthropology, um, and, uh, and geographers. Uh, so it's, it's a, a real diverse uh, bunch. But we needed a few things to kind of uh, bring it all together. So we had a couple of kind of key uh, themes uh, and the key themes are uh, identity, um, politics, um, and belonging. To what extent um, are these trends making Taiwan a, a multicultural uh, society? What kind of identification trends are we seeing among these uh, groups that are moving out of Taiwan and the groups that are moving uh, into uh, Taiwan? Um, so it's a, a real kind of um, uh, diverse uh, collection. Um, one of the feelings I had um, when I was starting to get a, a, a feel of this topic was that politics of migration was really being neglected. And that was one of the reasons why we pushed that uh, side um, quite hard. Now, how does, a, how does a kind of electoral and party politics person get into uh, this, uh, this topic of uh, migration? Um, for me, it's really been an eye-opening process to, to kind of get a grip of uh, of this, and I really feel I've kind of learned a huge amount from this uh, this project. It all started out back in mid 2010 when uh, Lin Ping and Cho Weifen and myself were kind of getting together, and we wanted to try and find some topic that we could do together. But because we're from such kind of diverse areas, Cho Weifen is a film literature person, Lin Ping is a, really an anthropologist in the politics department. Um, so what could we do together? And the, the kind of common feature we had was Isabel, and the, um, um, who was my PhD student uh, at this point in time. And after um, 
a, year, a number of years of struggling together, and um, uh, I thought that maybe this would be a good topic that um, uh, we could kind of uh, develop. Um, and, uh, and I suppose, uh, in many ways, the first person I should, I should really thank for, for this project, I think it is Isabel, who was my PhD student and now a lecturer in, uh, at Portsmouth. I mean, in theory, a supervisor is supposed to influence a, um, their student, but in many ways, I think it's probably been, I think Isabel's probably influenced me far more. And one of the uh, examples of this is that I even teach migration now in my kind of comparative politics class. Um, so it shows the kind of impact that you've, uh, you've had on me. Um, okay, now practically how do we organize this? Um, um, what we did was to organize uh, two conferences. Uh, we had one conference in Georgetown uh, University's Huizun Forest Campus, a real idyllic uh, kind of mountain forest location. Um, and we had about 10 papers in that first conference. Uh, and then we had a follow-up conference uh, in the summer of, um, of 20, uh, 2011, um, where um, yeah, all five of us were there at that, uh, that conference. Um, and this, this is the, only the second edited volume that I've actually uh, done. And of course, um, a, a lot of what I did in this project was learning from, what, from, Dump, from working together with Dumpy on an earlier book. And one of the big lessons I had from that project was you've got to have too many chapters and then you can kind of narrow down. Um, so of course, what we found was that the very few papers from the first conference actually got into the, um, uh, the final version. But I think with only one exception, uh, all the papers from the second conference are actually um, uh, in the, um, uh, the volume. Um, I mean, there's so many people I, should, I need to thank for, the, for, for this. And of course, I should say a few words about the, the funding for this conference. We received money from Georgetown University, Georgetown University, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, that was for, mainly for the first conference. And for the second conference, our major funder was the Jianjin Guo uh, Foundation. Uh, and we also got support from the Taiwan, um, the Taiwan representative office. So for example, um, on the second day of our conference, we had a SOAS strike. Um, so what could we do? Cancel the conference? Uh, no, we moved our second day of our conference to the um, uh, Taiwan representative office's meeting room, and we, we, and we carried on uh, discussing um, uh, there. Um, of course, I should thank Hardina Olendorf, who played a key role in organizing the, um, uh, the event, and of course, my, uh, our book editor, Daniel Mojahidi, who a number of you uh, know, who worked on, on editing the book. Um, now, the order we're going to uh, do this is, uh, I'm not going to talk about every chapter. What we're going to do is, uh, we'll just get the, um, the chapter authors, just to talk a little bit uh, about uh, their own uh, research. And then hopefully we should have a fair amount of time for, uh, uh, for, for Q&A. Um, and um, oh, let me just say a little bit about who's who. Um, okay, on, on, uh, I've said quite a bit about Isabel, who's now a lecturer at uh, Portsmouth, so another, like me, another SOAS graduate. Uh, then next along we've got Li uh, Junyi uh, from uh, Nottingham University's uh, China um, Centre. Um, School of Chinese Studies. School of Chinese Studies. Yeah. Um, and then we've got uh, Deng Yuqin, who's a, um, um, finished your PhD at social, in Sociology and Ethics, and now is doing some teaching at, at Sociology and, uh, and Ethics. And then finally, we've got Professor Anthony Fielding, um, who's uh, from the uh, originally from the geography department in in Sussex, um, and and he was the uh, the wonderful accident about this conference, but because he, he heard about the conference on on a migration mailing list, uh, and uh, sat through two days of Taiwan. He's, he's a Japan migration specialist, uh, and really enjoyed the uh, the the um, uh, the event, and then. Um, at the end of the conference, because he'd been listening to so much, and he read all the papers, uh, and then we asked him just to, to have a, um, a very short talk on his comparative insights for comparing Japan and South Korea. Uh, and again, this had a big impact on my future uh, teaching, but that talk at the end of the conference became his uh, wonderful chapter, which we, of course we, we use in uh, our Northeast Asia uh, clock. For okay, so without further ado, uh, Juni, over to you. I 
really would like to first thank Steffi to put this wonderful book launch event for all of us. And also, I remember quite vividly two years ago of the conference in SOAS, that was such a hot debate and it was, for me, also it's a, it was an eye-winding experience because right the, my chapter now here, it was presented then as a conference paper. And um, the reason I remember vividly because my discussion very um, dignified to ask me, are you sure the data you got is rare? Mm. Are you sure you got the right answer? Because actually what I'm dealing with in my chapter is Taiwanese businessmen, their identity fluid or changed in the process of their investigation. So um, they started in my chapter, I mentioned at the beginning they started their, their investment in the uh, early, uh, well, in the 1980s, and then um, they started, now it's over three, uh, 30 years, three decades. At the beginning, the identity was more for Taiwanese, and also they were quite looked down a Chinese identity because they didn't want to integrate. But through my uh, field work and my interviews with my interviewees, during my two field work trips, one in, one in 2005 and one in 2009, I realized that their identity actually changed. Um, they kind of more integrated, if you like, into the Chinese society. And they accept more that their identity are Chinese rather than uh, only Taiwanese, which I kind of put many interview notes, I quoted a lot in my chapter. Well, this is the reason that um, many of my, well, if you read my chapter, you also would think that why that would be the case, we always would presume that the Taiwanese people would have a strong identity in China. I, my chapter kind of against this argument because that is rightly because my interview group are Taiwanese businessmen and they are owners of the factories, they are chairmen of enterprises, they have to be more integrated into society. So this chart actually reflects a particular group of people, Taiwanese people in China, for their economic interest in China. It's kind of, in a way, economic interest influence their acknowledgement of identity. Of course, at the end of the day, we won't be able to know in their deep heart, whether they still really more for Taiwan or more for China, that would be nobody would be answer, uh, would be able to answer that question. But I do realize that in the process of their investment, especially in the, especially during Taiwan's economic kind of a little bit go on the decline and after the financial crisis, um, they do kind of touch more into the Chinese society. Again, as Daffy. Uh, our, uh, as Daffy mentioned at the very beginning, this is a book combined with different perspectives. So maybe other authors or other chapters would have different perspectives rather than my perspective from the business people. I just start from here because I know that this is just a very brief introduction and please also welcome all of your questions later on if you want to discuss more about Taishan, Taiwan specimens, identity in China. Thank you. Perhaps one of the things I would add is that I think a, a lot of the findings are dependent on the actual um, um, groups that we're interviewing. So for example, Li Ping's uh, looking at um, uh, mainlanders that have moved to, to China and, and his findings were also quite different. Similarly, yeah. Zheng Yanfen's work on single professionals, again, I think you, you're right there, that it's the, the, um, um, that, but I think that's why your findings are really interesting actually. And if it was my discussion, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's again, it's uh, integration of, well, it's a combination of different perspectives. This is what I think. Mm. Yeah. And I think one thing I did forget to say is one of the things I found really eye-opening about both conferences is that we're all working on migration in Taiwan, but a lot of us actually met for the first time uh, in these conferences uh, because people who are working, for example, on film uh, didn't know the work of people who are working on, on politics of migration. So that was one of the things I found really enjoyable about those, both those events. But yeah, over to you as well. Thank you.
thank you for um, inviting me here. And every time I come back to you, so I always feel, can I say in the Chinese words, Hui Niang Jia, because as of someone who lives in this country alone, you feel like this is your spiritual home. So it's always feeling very homely to come back. But as someone who speaks about this, uh, her own research, it's probably one of the first times that I can say this is my chapter. I remember I read someone's book saying, oh, right, finish your book, it's like giving a birth. Now I have to give it birth. Uh, so I, I more or less understand the process. And every time I talk about my research, I always feel very passionate. And now I feel more because I feel that I'm reliving the experiences of my interviewees had in Taiwan since they came to this small island from China, Southeast Asia, mainly from Indonesia, Vietnam, and uh, the Philippines. So the title of this uh, uh, chapter is Homegoing or Homemaking. There were, uh, by 2010, there had been uh, 26,551 Indonesian women. But how, why could I open this um, uh, chapter by saying they are unknown? They are not unknown, of course, they are known as Indonesian brides. They are known to their teachers, neighbors, uh, government officials that they are brides. But to me, they are unknown to be Indonesian Chinese. Their Chinese ethnicity was largely unknown. It's not that people don't know that they're Chinese, it's just somehow in the research that the that their Chinese ethnicity is not uh, being flagged up. Um, exceptions that they are known as Hakka, there has been a specific um, um, research about how the uh, Hakka women in West Kalimantan being sort of sought, particularly by the Hakka community in Taiwan as uh, ideal brides, but largely their Chinese um, uh, ethnicity is unknown. So if they were unknown, how can I know them? I have to thank the very first interviewee I had, her name given to me is An Siudie. Um, I still remember very well in her very dark, a small flat in Tucheng. She was telling me how she grew up, that she, her father from Fuzhou didn't allow her to go to Indonesian state school. She had to go to Chinese language school, and she, she called uh, Indonesian, uh, indigenous Indonesian as Huana. Anyone who can speak Taiwanese know that Huana means savages or barbarians. So for her, uh, she still used this kind of term as uh, opposed to the Indonesian people called Chinese China. These are two very derogatory terms. And there's a lot about her experiences being uh, growing up in Indonesia as an ethnic other. I heard a lot about these stories from, uh, took this question away from her home. I'm thinking, what exactly she was telling me, I don't understand. I didn't really understand. And I've, after doing a lot of more reading, I realized that she was brought up, she and a few other ladies I interviewed were brought up in an in era where the Chinese um, have to split their um, identity uh, supporting the Communist China or Republic China, which is Kuomintang. Uh, and also there's a clash, uh, ethnic clashes between the Chinese and the indigenous Indonesians. Um, when usually very violent, including decapitation. I have a, a, a lady who tells me um, how her mom was horrified to see Chinese men's head being chopped off and uh, been uh, picked, uh, been, been carried by the indigenous Indonesian man. So this kind of thing were how they grew up with, and that is how I say they have a, dis a diasporic Chinese identity. They also belong to the era where uh, their loyalty towards China or Taiwan was really a critical political asset in a way that it has to be competed by both governments across the Taiwan Strait. Hence, the, uh, on the part of Taiwan gov uh, Taiwanese government, easier access to citizenship was given to these overseas Chinese. Apart from these old ladies, I also have younger ladies who told me quite, not quite similar stories. They got along well with the Indonesian people, they had adopted Indonesian Names. They went to Indonesian uh, state school. They were brought up in the official uh, nation building project um, known as In Diversity We, you, we Are United. So, this is two different groups of uh, Indonesian ladies I met, and one younger, one older. So, what did they tell me? This kind of ethnic uh, background was largely ignored by people who study about migrants in Taiwan. So, I came up with three questions. Did uh, the Chinese identity play a role in the decision of migration? Um, did, uh, how did they express their Chinese identity in their everyday life? 
and how they enact it. And also uh, how to get their Chinese identity interact with the society of Taiwan, because let's not forget that when they came to Taiwan, Taiwan has started to assert its own identities um, separate from the Chinese identity. So these are the three big questions I have. My findings are that indeed the Chinese identity had a role to play in their decision to migrate. I, um, three things I, I, I could summarize. That first of all, they, come, they came to Taiwan for the uh, aspiring um, uh, belonging. One lady told me, two ladies, why well, said that to, in order to go, to go back to China, we came to Taiwan. You may find this sound <laughs> rather strange, but she was talking about the Republic of China as the real home of Chinese, although everyone knows that Taiwan is not geographical home of their ancestors. But the other lady said, oh, I only feel home, feel safe, feel no threat of my, uh, to my life when I came back to Taiwan. Don't, um, uh, they, they use the word, came back or return. Another thing is uh, they came to Taiwan for the pursuit of safety and dignity. This particularly referred to the uh, Indonesian uh, in 19, uh, May 1998, there was an anti-Chinese um, um, uh, riot. Um, lots of, um, I don't know the exact number, but there have been reported quite a few cases of Chinese women being raped. Hence, uh, one lady told me her parents told her the reason why they wanted her to marry off to Taiwan is if our entire family was killed, at least one of our daughters survived well in Taiwan. So this kind of story is not picked up by other uh, researchers, but for me this says very uh, strongly about their Chinese identity. So how does this kind of identity interact really with their daily life then? I found uh, citizenship is a good, uh, is, is a very uh, useful context for us to see how their identity could be enacted. One is that um, the first, uh, one of the ladies got really, she came to Taiwan in 1983 as a, st a student. She felt that she was well treated by the government of Taiwan and she was also um, got um, um, citizenship. And that is a strong contrast to another lady who came to Taiwan much later, being regarded as a uh, foreigner. So she had to go through of the process of applying for citizenship. And for her, that just shows she'd been rejected by her parents. She was specifically saying, I am the child of the Chinese parents, and why did you reject me? You should open your arms, welcome me to back home. Why did you set so many difficult um, uh, obstacles, such as I have to pass the language uh, proficiency test in order to apply for citizenship? So these are the, I found the Chinese, uh, the citizenship legislation is a good context for, for me to really detect where the Chinese identity worked. And then, um, apart from these ladies, I said, uh, having these diasporic identity, there are other younger generations who have, should we just say, hybrid identity. Those younger ladies who were uh, brought up and educated at state school. For them, I say that they, they do not claim they are homegoing when they come, came back to Taiwan. They were homemaking because, um, as a mother, they gave birth in Taiwan, brought up their children, their, their sense of citizenship is very much uh, derived from their motherhood. So when I asked them about voting, they would say, yes, I go to vote because I'm a mother here, I care about the, the well-being of my children. Because of, I am a mother, I care. So that's the, uh, how I um, claim that um, um, they are not home, they do not come back home. Uh, in terms of migration, but they make Taiwan their home. So these are my uh, major findings of this chapter. I should just stop here. Uh, more questions will come later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Isabel. I think one of the things that this this uh, raises is that um, many of these uh, migration trends that um, that we highlight in this book. Um, are pushed by non-economic factors. I mean, for example, uh, in uh, Isabel's case, it's uh, racial discrimination within Indonesia. Um, in another chapter, for example, that looks at Taiwanese in Guam and Canada, uh, many of these moved during the, uh, the height of martial law. And it was often um, uh, political persecution was a key, or dissatisfaction with martial law Taiwanese politics was very important. Um, similarly, in, in Limping's chapter, for example, 
um, among some um, mainlanders. It was, it was, um, uh, there was a sense of discrimination uh, by the DDP government, which seemed to have pushed some of those uh, mainlanders to, thanks, uh, to migrate uh, to China. Similar, just, and just like in uh, Isabel's chapter, a sense of moving to China, moving to any kind of imagined China. Um, but again, in both Lincoln's chapter and Isabel's one, we do see a sense of uh, disappointment after moving to this uh, imagined uh, homeland. Okay, let me move on now to talk a little bit about um, uh, my chapter. Um, the way I tried to get at this migration topic was to look at how migration was dealt with in election advertising. Okay, for those of you that take my classes know how, how kind of crazy I am about uh, election ads. So I, I wanted to find a way where I could, I could link my kind of, um, um, uh, this kind of passion of mine. Um, and what I did was to, to look at newspaper and television ads over a 20 year period. And uh, I wanted to see um, how Taiwanese political parties dealt with this uh, issue. Um, if we think about our own case, we can see how um, salient or how influential the migration issue is in European uh, elections. To what extent would we see similar patterns, particularly if we think about the scale of migration um, in Taiwan, is no less than that in most uh, European countries. What were the findings over, over 20 years? Um, well, I think the, the initial finding was that there was so little attention to migration, at least until the last couple of elections. It seemed to be the missing issue in uh, Taiwanese election uh, politics. Often the issues, the way that migration was tackled by political parties was tackling very old issues or non-issues. So for example, in the 1990s there was quite a lot of attention to mainlanders. Those might, those that migrated to Taiwan 1949 to 1950. Uh, either uh, pro-mainlander uh, ads or rather indirect anti-mainlander uh, ads. So for example, making fun of Hobbiton would be an example of an anti-mainlander uh, ad. While there would be ads that eulogized the, um, uh, the role of mainlanders in developing Taiwanese uh, society. So very mainlander focused positive ads coming out of the KMT. Um, another big message that we get, both in the 1990s and in 2008, um, was about a non-issue, a non-existent migration issue. And that's the issue of um, uh, Chinese labor migration to Taiwan. Okay. Um, first, in the mid-1990s, the DPP starts having this terror message. Unification equals mass migration from, uh, from China. Uh, we get this again, very, this terror message very, very heavily again in 2008, where it looks like the KMT is going to come back to power. And we've got these, these images of um, Chinese train stations with crowds of, of, um, uh, of people. But of course, um, um, we, we don't have um, uh, Chinese labor migration in Taiwan, even after the KMT comes back to power. That's why I talk about being a, a, a non-issue. Uh, One issue that we gradually get an increase on uh, over time is attention to the Taishan. So gradually the parties start to take the Taishan seriously. But again, it doesn't really happen until about um, 2008, is the first election where there's, there's real uh, attempt to appeal to Taishan. And also an involvement of, in Taishan uh, in the election campaign. So ads sponsored by Taishan really start to emerge in 2008 and to an even greater extent in, in 2012. Um, it's only really um, in um, 2012 that we start to get some significant and quite positive appeals to our Taiwanese <coughs> migrant spouses, um, um, particularly the Southeast Asian spouses. And I think um, generally we have this idea that the KMT is much more friendly towards uh, migrant spouses, particularly uh, from the, the mainland. But mainland spouses don't seem to appear um, in the ads it's still Southeast Asia that so seems to be more common. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of, of clips just to kind of give you a bit of a, a sense. Um, what the, uh, the first one I'm going to show you is a KMT ad from, uh, from 2012. And 
it's a, a recycled ad. Some of my students will probably see this a couple of times, but I think it's, for those of you that haven't, I think it's definitely worth seeing, because I didn't actually use this in the conference, because it, it came um, uh, bef uh, after the actual uh, conference. So it's number 13. Okay. And are actually part of the, the, uh, the core ethnic uh, groups. And the, the, um, the Kenti also has ads that talk about, for example, a Dominican, a half Dominican, half French lady who's, who's suddenly become a, uh, a real hacker and learns to uh, um, uh, cook hacker food. And, uh, although the message is very similar. I'm Taiwanese, I'm hacker, but my citizenship is ROC. Okay, so it's still tied into some of our traditional um, uh, nationalism. Okay, now, the interesting thing about this campaign is that we also get a, uh, the DDP actually has one ad which is trying to reach out to um, uh, the, the spouses. And that's the, the last ad I'm going to show you, number 63. Uh, 60? Oh yeah, yeah, 62. Okay, and this ad is quite a unique one, I think. And, and talking about um, uh, promoting um, um, mother tongue uh, within these kind of uh, cross-cultural families. Uh, and again, I think it's really interesting because when you actually look at these families in, uh, in detail, the general trend is that the, the fathers are discouraging the, uh, the children to actually learn the uh, Southeast Asian uh, languages. At least that's my impression. They, they tend to be very, very patriarchal kind of uh, families that these spouses are moving into. Uh, but finally, an, an attempt by the DBB to kind of get rid of that kind of negative uh, stereotype, which is something that features again uh, in, in Eugene's uh, paper. Uh, okay, right. Uh, so that kind of gives you an impression. Um, it's finally starting to get some attention, but it's, it's taken a bit of time. And I think, yeah, so Eugene's yours is a good kind of follow up now, because looking at the uh, uh, social movements and the politics of um, particularly mainlander spouses. So, over to you. Thank you, Gabby. Am I allowed to 
you remain sitting here. Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I first want to thank Stanley to give me this chance to uh, present the articles. Um, I still remember two years ago, I was in the middle of uh, my PhD study and I was struggling a lot and then I came up with an article and I joined the conference in SOAS. And then I got a lot of valuable uh, inputs, especially from Isabel and the deaf aid, and they helped me a lot to take shape of this article. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about the findings and um, the points that we made, we have made in this article. So, um, for those who are not familiar with the mainland spouse issues, um, so mainland, mainland spouse is here, I mean, I refer to um, mainland Chinese women marrying a uh, Taiwanese husband. And this is a highly gendered phenomenon, like over 90% follow this pattern which is um, Chinese women marrying Taiwanese husband. So uh, by the end of 2013, on the total population of 23 million, there are almost half a million married immigrants in Taiwan, of whom um, 0 0.3 to 8 million are uh, mainland spouses, coming down to 1.4% uh, of the total population in Taiwan. And uh, if these numbers are not striking enough, um, over the newborn babies, there are 7.54% um, 7 .5, 7 are given birth to by non-Taiwanese mothers. Of course, these uh, includes um, non from um, every nationalities. So now, um, the I'm going to move on to the history of the mainland spouses phenomena. It started um, since 1987, which is the lifting of martial law. And uh, the lifting of martial law kind of opened up the door for um, mainland, mainland, um, women, mainland, spouse, mainland spouses to marry a Taiwanese husband. And uh, this phenomenon um, begins with the pattern that um, retired soldiers go and um, went back to their hometown and uh, get married with um, local women. That's, that was the first pattern. Um, it happened in, 19, in 1987, but uh, this phenomenon hasn't been regulated until 1992, the enactment of the statute governing relations between people of the Taiwan area and the mainland China area. So hereafter we call it the statute. And, uh, and this law also results in the differentiated situation between mainland spouses and uh, all the other mainland, blah, all the other marriage immigrants from uh, other countries because they are entitled to national national uh, nationality law. So this uh, differentiated uh, enactment of the law bring about um, different situation, uh, different conditions of like. Um, their right to work and uh, their procedure to um, obtain citizenship. So um, this is the kind of basic uh, background knowledge of the mainland spouse phenomena. And then um, I'm going to move on to talk about the article. So uh, the article, um, the focus of this article is the collective movement of mainland spouses against the discrimination uh, institutionalized by the regulations and how they, through the collective movement, how they negotiate with the government and uh, um, negotiate over their right to citizenship. And the special attention is paid to um, the collective movement in 2002 and uh, three, And this was because um, the DP the government back then um, tried to um, prolong the minimum waiting period of uh, um, obtaining citizenship from 8 to 11, 11 years. So it kind of triggered um, the discontent uh, among men and spouses. And this was the first collective, um, collective movement of men and spouses. And that it was also, it, it was led by a group, uh, uh, a advocacy group called CCSMH, 
E A, <laughs> long, <laughs> like this group, um, whose whose members are mainly the Taiwanese husband. So um, our approach to look at this um, Melon's Bowes movement is to look at it in the political context and uh, to juxtapose it with the changing political climate in Taiwan. Um, in other words, how uh, in other words, um, how they interact with Taiwan's party politics and uh, competing the national national building project. So more importantly, we examine the strategies they deployed in the in response to the changing political environment in order to generate more uh, social supports um, as, as as much as possible from um, from the society. Um, so it's important to look at the um, political context of this movement, and uh, the polit um, we started from um, before before the democrat democratization. So they were they were seen as the allies of communists um, by um, like in the eighties and nineties, and then. Um, the DPP party inherited this kind of uh, mindset and keep seeing them as the um, keep seeing them as the allies of communist party and the, this could be proved by the uh, frequent use of the national security as excuse to you know violate their rights but luck luckily and then I suppose it's got some support, support by the uh, splinters group of KMT, KMT party, such as uh, during the DPP led period, such as the supports from um, Xindang, the new party, and the People's First Party. So, and during the DPP led um, government period, the KMT majority, uh, majority, uh, Parliament majority kind of protect protect the reforms of the regulation, which might have been brought more like human rights violations to um, men and spouse, those men and spouses. And of course, the result of it was um, the men and spouses movement. In avoided, in avoidably, they are dragged into the partisans' politics and being politicized. So that is the basic um, political context. And the, then we identify the difficulties of the movement, of the uh, Melan Spouses movement. And then the first is the legal, legal difficulties, like they are not allowed to um, participate in demonstrations or organize themselves as, and register as the official parties, because these activities do not conform uh, with the purpose of they entering Taiwan. So they are. They were um, presented by others, like their husbands and other um, social organizations. So that's the first difficulties. And then the second difficulties we and they fight against is the uh, stereotype about Manus Moses, which is uh, linked with China nationalism, and communist, and this kind of national characters. And uh, the last one. Last difficulty is um, um, Melan's phenomena as a highly gendered phenomena. They did not evoke the uh, empathy or sisterhood from a women's movement in Taiwan, and that was because the commercial character of Melan's poses, uh, which was considered as like a strengthening the underlying patriarchy, and uh, um, Melan's poses. Uh, were associated with sex work and uh, illegal employment. So these are difficulties of uh, Melan's process movement. And then we move on to look at the strategy they deployed. There are two strategies. strategies. One is the use of human rights language. Um, the use of human rights language we can um, see it in um, slogans they chant in the protest in, like, during the 2002 and 2003, and also the banners in, on the banners, like they claim, um, we want citizenship, we need human rights, 
to, they use a lot of humor on <coughs> language. And the, the advantage of using this language is first, it's a very fresh political prevalence term, and uh, it also tie themselves, tie themselves with uh, DPP's um, governing principle, which is based, supposed to be based on human rights. And then the second advantage is um, using of human rights language kind of enlarge the alliance with other uh, migrant advocacy groups by weakening the um, politicization. Like, and so it kind of enlarged the possibility to um, work together with other um, marriage migrants. So, and uh, the other strategy they use is that they play out a bit with the nationalistic script. By, um, for example, they had a press conference called We Love Taiwan. And uh, during the conference, they really strongly claimed that we love Taiwan. So it, it kind of plays a bit with the nationalistic character, and try to refuse, refute the Chinese national, national character of themselves. And to sum up, um, we think that mainland spouses phenomena hasn't been seen as just uh, um, marriage immigrants since they carry these national characters that would provoke the already uh, confronting political agents and uh, environment. And yet, on the other hand, um, this phenomena is never as simple as the partisan politi politics or like unification, independent preference. And the right of um, right and the rights and the well-being of male spouses shouldn't be and cannot be manipulated by single party or single government. So what I'm hoping is that the increased economic integration and the more and more frequent like cross-strait communication could kind of normalize this phenomena and stop seeing it as an issue. Thank you very much. One of the things I think is really interesting about uh, Yu Xin's uh, work is that it's looking at us, we tend to think we have a stereotype that social movements are kind of uh, always aligned with the DVP. And I think one of the really interesting things about this one is it's such an exceptional uh, social movement. So I, that's one thing I really like about uh, this, this work. Okay, now we move to our final chapter speaker. That's uh, uh, Tony Fielding. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, David used the phrase a happy accident uh, to describe my involvement in this program. It was a happy accident for, for me as well. But let me tell you, that when I joined the group, uh, the workshop, uh, the, the conference, uh, I was terribly conscious of the fact that everybody else was presenting um, very learned papers on, on Taiwan. And here was I, the outsider, as it were, who knew almost nothing about Taiwan. Um, uh, I felt uh, as if, uh, you know, I was a little bit of an intruder in the party. But um, then uh, I, I think, I, well, I see it as a great privilege that you've uh, allowed me to, to become involved because I have enjoyed it enormously and I've learned a, a lot. But what I've learned, uh, many of the things I've learned from the conference and since um, with the book, is, uh, concerns the, the, the unique, uniqueness of migration to and from Taiwan. It's, it's a very, very interesting case. It's special. Um, but at the same time as I was learning how unique it was, I was conscious again and again of parallels between what was happening in Taiwan and what was happening in other parts of the world, including other parts of East Asia. And so when I was asked to do the, the final summing up chapter, I thought to myself, well, let me think of ways in which I can kind of link what it is that's been talked about in, in the case of Taiwan with what has been happening in other countries. And I'm just going to hint at uh, some of the themes, if you like, of the final chapter, which does that task of linking uh, this case, the, the Taiwan case, to the, to the wider East Asian case. And the first one, and it's been touched on several times, is the, is the degree of feminization of the, of the migration flow to Taiwan. And roughly speaking, in, in 40 years, the proportion of women in the migrants to Taiwan doubled. 
And that's not at all unusual around the world. There has been a feminization of migration flows in many, many parts. Not, no, it's not everywhere, of course. Migration is an extraordinarily complex set of processes. And so it doesn't happen everywhere. But generally speaking, there has been a feminization process. And that's certainly true also for other countries in East, East Asia. Now, how um, do uh, women be become part of the Taiwan? Well, as we've heard, for example, as the, as the wives of, uh, of, of Taiwanese men as care workers and so on. Is that unique to Taiwan? Not at all. The situation in Korea, South Korea is very similar with respect, for example, to marriage migrants. If you look at uh, the recent big increase in the number of marriage migrants to South Korea, uh, they come from similar origins, from, from Vietnam, from, uh, from the Philippines. Where do they go? They go to the rural areas of South Korea, just as they do in the case of Taiwan. In the case of Taiwan, only about half of, uh, of the uh, Vietnamese, as I understand it, uh, uh, of, the national, of the national average of Vietnamese finish up in Taipei, much higher proportions in the world areas. South Korea, exactly the same. Japan, long story of, of, of Philippine migrants to rural areas in, in, in northern Japan. So that, that there is definite similarity and parallels, if you like, there. Second thing that I pick up is this issue of co-ethnicity. Very, very interesting issue. Uh, we've seen it, of course, in the case of Europe with the Aussiedler and the German return, so-called return migration. But in East Asia, it's a big, big issue because so many cases you have, um, you have groups of people brought together by migration who have common ancestry, but who, when they come together, face problems, face difficulties. Their relationship is ambivalent. It's not easy. It's often, in fact, very difficult. And that's true in other cases in East Asia, particularly, for example, the Joseon Jok uh, migrants from northeast China uh, migrating to, incidentally, many of those are also uh, marriage migrants, uh, migrating to South Korea, finding a home in the ancestral homeland, but, uh, okay, not always very easily and often in uh, circumstances which are not at all satisfactory. Again, of course, the Nikkei Jin uh, from South America, Brazilian, uh, Brazilian, nationals of Japanese descent uh, coming back to Japan. Coming back, of course, it's not they're not coming back. It's the grandchildren, in a sense, who are coming back to Japan uh, and finding it difficult to settle uh, in Japan. Um, in all sorts of ways, I mean, they, they, are, they are industrial workers, of course, and they're playing an extraordinarily important role in, in Japanese industry. But in, often, the, the relationships, the difficulties of the relationships come out in home life and in neighborhoods where, for example, uh, there's a tendency for, uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but there's a tendency for the Nikkei Jin uh, to hug one another. It's something you do in South America. You don't do that in Japan. They start their parties at 10 o'clock at night. That's when Japanese people are going to sleep. You know, there are problems, if you like, in the relationships. I'm exaggerating. But you get my point. It, this is not a, a, an easy relationship. Now, co-ethnicity is not just to do with immigration. It's also, of course, to do with emigration, issues to do with Taishan. We've been talking about uh, Taishan earlier. And this, I think, brings us into another very interesting field, because not all migration, of course, is the migration of, of, of manual workers or of care workers or of, ma or of marriage migration. A lot of it is highly skilled and, and highly qualified migration and, and owners and so on. And here, I think, again, there are parallels between the you know, Taiwan case and the case for, for uh, China, uh, for um, South Korea and Japan. I was very much reminded of this when um, one of the papers about the Taishang uh, in China talked about the, the, uh, early, the early days when the, they came in as welcomed investors. Um, and, uh, and the relationships were very much focused on how important this was for, for the economic development of those workers. Wasn't that exactly the same uh, when the Japanese investment was taking, was going abroad and people were saying, please come, we need your, we want your investment. And they were, it was almost like a kind of new form colonial relationship, if you like, between the investing, uh, the investing incoming investors and, and the local uh, communities. And some of the relationships also, to, well, some of the awkwardnesses that arise from working, living and working abroad um, are similar in other parts of East Asia. For example, uh, in South Korea, there's something called Kirogi uh, Gasok. The, these are the wild geese families. This is where uh, it's very important for K Korean families 
to, to have their children um, going to an international school and learning English. So sometimes the family splits up, and, uh, and uh, I understand from some, some of the things I've heard that this tension also exists uh, in some cases in the case of, in, in the case of Taiwan. And problems sometimes is reinsertion back into the uh, society as, as a result of having lived a period of time abroad. Which brings me on to another theme. It's happened so often that the initial migration then triggers new kind of uh, further migrations. And it seems to me that in the case of the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China, we have saw early on the businessman going in. But now what we see is something much more diverse. Um, one of the papers was talking about Shanghai Rush, as if now there was this sort of uh, much greater diversity of people moving into China for all sorts of complicated, all sorts of different kinds of reasons. Again, a very similar uh, situation. I mean, take the Japanese in London. You only have to go back, what, 20, 25, 30 years, and the Japanese community in London was almost entirely salarymen who were, who were in intra-organizational transfers, people who'd been moved by their uh, business, to, uh, and they were located in London for a few years to look after that business for a while, then go back to, to Japan. That, uh, that, then they were there with their trailing spouses. I know that's a, an ugly term, but it's an honest one. Uh, they were there with their wives and children uh, very often, um, uh, uh, and, and that was almost the Japanese community in London. What is it today? It's almost super diverse in terms of, of, of the, very, the very different kinds of people who are now embedded and integrated into, into the London economy. And then at the end of my chapter, I try to link um, the Taiwan situation with some very broad ideas about how migration works. Migration is very much about moving from one place to another in order to try and change your situation, to try and improve your to try and improve economically your situation. And certain places in the world are so well endowed in terms of the opportunities that they offer that they act as a kind of, uh, as a kind of escalator mechanism, a social, a social class, an occupational class escalator. They, you, you, you step on the escalator by migrating there when you're a young adult. The, the, it, it, the rich environment that you are in now that helps you to uh, in, in, improve yourself, to raise yourself in terms of your uh, status and pay and your position in the, labor, in the labor market. And then at some stage you'll move on or perhaps go back to the place that you came from originally. Now it seems to me that uh, many of the stories that we heard about Taiwanese migration can fit to that. Certainly earlier on it was an internal migration, of course, to Taiwan. But now it's international and that's another very interesting feature of migration. It has shifted many of the relationships that one time were only internal to countries and now operating it's globalization, isn't it? Uh, are now operating at a transnational scale. And Shanghai does seem, from the, from the papers we heard, seems to be playing a very interesting role in relation to, uh, to Taiwan, Taiwanese, particularly the more educated and ambitious uh, younger adult populations. And finally, um, I tried to link the Taiwan case to a, a model called the New Immigration Model, which tries to explain why it is that countries that had been net emigration countries switched to become countries of net immigration, but oddly enough, not at the time when their economies were growing fastest, but often at the point at which their economies were slowing down. Or in the case of Japan, um, basically, I mean, I hate using this this uh, <laughs> this uh, sign, but flatline, right? Were not growing, and so J Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan all went from being net emigration countries to being net immigration countries at a time when their economies were beginning to slow down. And that model tries to explain that. And the situations, that, well, there are interesting parallels in all of those three cases. In particular, of course, key to it is the, in the sense, the end of the internal migration. The rapid economic development means that you have enormous process of urbanization sucking into the cities, into the manufacturing zones of the surplus labor, uh, labor from rural areas. But when that ends, when that is finished, there's a sudden problem. What happens now? Well, two things happen. First is that the wages of the indigenous population go up. Now, it's great if you're one of those workers, of course, you're getting better wages. But unfortunately for the employers, this is a problem. You're now paying much more for those workers. And if you can't afford it, if you're a small business, uh, then one of the answers, of course, is to start importing labor to fill, to fill that gap. 
And so what you're getting in these countries, if you like, is a shift into a situation where um, the increase in the wages is making it more difficult for the economy as a whole to perform well, but at the same time, so that's, if you like, involving the layoffs, perhaps, of indigenous population, but at the same time, certain parts of the economy are saying, we're desperate for labor, so we need to import workers from overseas. And it does seem to me that in all three cases, you can see that, uh, you can see that process working itself out. Great. Okay, so uh, we've got um, just over 20 minutes for uh, comments and um, the Q&A. Anyone want to um, uh, start? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question for Dr. Chen. Because about the Indonesian spouse's medical identity. Because as you mentioned, before they went to Taiwan, actually they came from a very Chinese background. And they went to Chinese language school in Indonesia. So I guess more or less they identify themselves as a Chinese. But, uh, so I wonder, uh, after they, they went to Taiwan, their identity changed to be more Taiwanese. Uh, because, you know, uh, Chinese identity is more or less declining in political sense. Or um, they still feel themselves very Chinese and feel connected with JMT as the founder of the part of China. I should say, I know when I gave you these uh, strong, these very extreme, I should say, extreme cases, you have the impression that all ladies are crazy about Republic China. No. The, um, that's why the first lady gave me such, they were left with me such strong impact. What we are talking about are two generations. One group of the older ladies, aged between uh, 45 and 60, belong to that kind of a diasporic identity people. They see themselves as part of the Third Republic of China because they're parents. But the other ladies who are introduced to me by their Indonesian names um, are those who were brought up or having a hybrid identity. So for them, they, they are actually more, they feel they are more Indonesian than Chinese. So, um, so the first group of ladies came to Taiwan and I feel they're actually misplaced in Taiwan. They feel that they return to their homeland. But that is why that, that, that younger lady, although she's younger, but she had a strong identity. Um, as I mentioned, she felt that she criticized a lot about the citizen legislation, and saying, why didn't you work on me? I'm your lost child. I'm a real child. I'm not adopted child. I'm your, your child by blood. Why did you reject me? She's actually very uh, unique. Um, but most, all others, uh, um, at the same um, age cohort, actually feel that they are more Indonesian than Chinese. Uh, except one lady told me, she said, when I was 15, my dad told me we are Chinese and one day we should go back home. I don't understand what he was talking about. But when I came to Taiwan, when I was, my plane was just about to land, I had a glimpse of the land and I feel, yes, this is home. And so I described that as a kind of, kind of a dormant identity, being waking, waking for that moment, do it's a strong surge of emotion, but in their real life, um, the, for the older ladies, they probably feel a, a bit misplaced. I, I, I shouldn't say they, they feel misplaced, they feel they, they went back home. But this is, um, they still see themselves as Chinese, and, and Taiwan should be, Taiwan is for Chinese or Chinese by Chinese. But the other younger uh, uh, group of uh, Indonesian ladies do not really see that way. That's why I describe them as one group is homegoing and the other group is actually homemaking. And for those younger women, uh, because they have stronger uh, Indonesian identity, they actually do not really feel that homely in Taiwan. Because now the reason why I say they're unknown is people, uh, for, for people in Taiwan, Indonesian now means backward poor, uneducated, rural, they, strangely, they, it seems that society has forgotten that they are actually uh, overseas Chinese. So for these ladies, they feel they, uh, they've been looked down upon, they've been discriminated, they've been singled out that they are foreigners, 
And indeed, by law, they're treated as foreigners as well, because they, there's no way for them to claim the uh, Republic of China nationality anymore. So here we are seeing a really a discrepancy between how people identify themselves and how they're treated by law. But I should not give you an impression that all ladies have this, this kind of thinking in their mind. Hence, we should really be careful about um, what kind of background they have um, before they came to Taiwan. But the, the case of the uh, 1998, the anti-Chinese raid, uh, the raid, anti-Chinese riot in Indonesia in May 1998 is an extreme case. Because I did see that the number of uh, women who came to Taiwan because of marriage ro rose a bit, um, but then it became, um, should we say, quiet down. So that is my very winding answer to your question. And one thing I have to follow up there was, I, mean, I think um, uh, it's something that, that, that Tony, you, you, you mentioned, in terms of the comparative difference, was that um, the Korean and Japanese cases seem to actually um, treat the co-ethnic spouses much more favorably. While in the Taiwanese case, and that really comes out in Yuchin's paper, it's actually the opposite. Yes. In other words, the Southeast Asians get treated, spouses are treated, at least were treated better than the uh, mainland Chinese spouses. And other, in many ways, that's the root of the, a lot of the anger that, that comes out of your, of your paper. Okay, yeah, uh, Mo. Um, I'm wondering that was discussed a how social welfare issues in these countries are shaping migration patterns. That's not the question. So, how social welfare regimes shape the you general trend? Actually, imagine it, you mean. Yeah. Um, and I suppose also whether the, um, uh, how social welfare regimes actually deal with these groups. Because, of course, I know it was a, a controversy about whether mainland students, for example, should be included within the national health. Uh, service. I wonder whether that question about welfare is something that cropped up at all in any of your uh, field work. Me? Uh, is that wise to any of us, I guess? <laughs> as far as I know, um, um, for... Okay, it's, things has changed a lot, especially for uh, men and spouses. So, before... Before... Um, Mainland spouses could not be inclu uh, included in national health insurance until like less than like two or four years. I couldn't remember. But um, while the the other marriage immigrants, they are entitled to national health insurance immediately. And now um, things has been um, changed. So both of all of them, oh, marriage immigrants, they are um, automatically. Um, entitled and it, com it becomes compulsory for them to join the national health insurance. I think, I mean, I think it would be really interesting considering how, how wonderful Taiwan's um, health insurance system is, um, particularly from a UK perspective, whether it act, does act as a, a magnet. I mean, it suddenly made me think about one of the first jobs I ever had after I graduated and I was working in Taiwan in a, in a, um, a, um, a micro in, immigration company. So we, we were kind of um, getting people ready to emigrate to Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And when, when we were talking to the customers about why they wanted to migrate, one of the first, apart from better education for their kids, one of them was good social welfare. Um, but I bet if we did the same interview now, the answer wouldn't be better social welfare. Because, of course, Taiwan is so proud about what an amazing social welfare system they, uh, uh, they have, particularly if they've been to the UK. Um, so, uh, so, I mean... And another point is that um, many social welfare, not the healthcare, but a lot of benefits that are uh, provided by the government requires the um, identity card. Um, and the identity card um, was linked with the obtaining of citizenship. So, um, the point... Um, that's why the men and spouses uh, are were really not happy about the you know enhancing the minimum waiting period of uh, getting citizenship because it means that um, no identity identity card, which also means that you can't open the bank account, you can't apply for the credit card, and then you couldn't have the driving license and things like that. So we have nice national health insurance, but. Uh, 
um, other benefits? You know, it's kind of discriminative. Uh, I wonder whether you wanted to I, comment on. I on can't provide <laughs> Taiwan's experience because mm. my field is in China. Mm. So my information would be Taiwan, Taiwanese people in China's situation. It certainly China does not provide any sort of. Um, Social welfare system is, is a, a big issue there. It's not only for not only for for non non Chinese residents, but also for them themselves. It's a big issue. Social welfare system is an important domestic problem for Chinese government at the moment. However, I what I learned from my interviewee is, as um, Tony mentioned before, that in the past, holding a Taiwanese um, Tribal document, Tai Bao Zhen, that's so called in Chinese, uh, is a was a privileged thing. And now it turned to be not as good because uh, Chinese government actually provide a lot of localization uh, beneficial policy for investors. So it's not exactly back to your point to the social welfare system, but the Chinese government actually provide better policy for domestic citizens. In that case, some Taiwanese investors, they would you know, it is, as I mentioned, it's economic interest driven then. To think about whether they hold a Taiwanese uh, travel document or actually to hold a Chinese citizenship. So, again, it's not totally about the social policy, social welfare system, but about investment interest that um, it has changed for, for the Taiwanese business investors, the thinking about their identity in that sense. <coughs> Yeah, Mike. Um, I was trying to think up some memories of about that time when I used to queue up at the immigration office for visa extensions and so on. And one thing I remember particularly, there were a lot of Sri Lankans at that time. Now that's a more distant origin and a, a non sort of Chinese uh, um, ethnicity. And um, do you remember the time when the, um, there was a certain kind of um, I guess from the fishing industry, they had to live on dormitory ships offshore. They weren't even allowed to set foot on land. Um, now, I, I don't know when that finished, because it didn't go on uh, until the last 10, 20 years. But, but I, think, I think you raise an, uh, uh, an interesting question, because um, uh, one of the challenges we had with this book was how do you include every kind of type of uh, migration Topic. I mean, so there the were the were areas that we kind of uh, missed out. I mean, I think, for example, the South Asian community is really a, a growing one in, in Taiwan. You just, uh, it just struck me when I was kind of uh, in uh, Akinasinika watching the cricket game uh, on the um, uh, on a very small uh, green because you do have so many new kind of um, uh, high tech um, uh, staff coming from South Asia, for example. Um, uh, similarly, we, well, probably the biggest omission in this book was not covering contract labour. Uh, we also missed out, for example, the Taiwanese community in California, which I think also is very significant politically. Um, but you're right that gradually we're seeing some improvement in the, in the human rights of these groups. But I think gradually is the big problem. And I think even in, in Eugene's chapter, the, you can see how things are getting better. But it's, it's not really a, a transformation, really. It's still quite limited. But Tony, you wanted well, to... I just want to, want to add, um, the South Asian um, uh, migrants in uh, uh, Japan and uh, South Korea is the big surprise story of the recent period. Mm -hmm. People didn't expect it, and suddenly they found significant numbers of, of Sri Lankans, uh, and Nepalese uh, and um, uh, Bangladeshis and so on in, in, in their countries when they w really weren't expecting it and that population is gone but it's complicated because one of the interesting uh, uh, groups of businessmen in, in Seoul for example are Indian <laughs> so it's not just workers working on uh, construction sites and so on which is typically where South Asians will be found it's also the business community I, I, I did some mapping of the, South Korea uh, from 2008 data and found to my amazement there was a, a peak of, um, of foreigners in a, in a rural area of southeast uh, uh, South Korea. And I, I, to start off, I didn't know what it was. And then I suddenly found out, of course, that this was the building 
of the Formula One racetrack. <laughs> and what happened, of course, they brought in a lot of South Asian labor to build that, that, that facility. Um, can I just add another little point? One of the small stories, but nevertheless very interesting stories about East Asia, which Taiwan fits into, is the importance of Southeast Asia, particularly in the Asians, as uh, crews uh, in, in shipping, uh, in the uh, fishing industry, and also um, as uh, processors uh, in uh, fish processing as well, so in, 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 uh, in South Korea, in, in Japan, but also I believe uh, in, to a small degree in Taiwan, you have uh, Southeast Asians in, in the fishing industry. Uh, yeah, just two point three. Taiwan would be about Burma, whether or not that was, would be another interesting uh, migration group to look at. But it's actually a question really to, to any of you, is whether or not that um, migration uh, to Taiwan has had an impact on military service or the ending of military service, and whether or not that migration has actually had a, an impact on why the decision to, 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 to end it as it is coming up whether or not there was a correlation between, between the two. Um, I remember Nikki asked this question before. I think yeah. it's, it's kind of, not really a rumor, but from one of the professors in National Junji University. I've been asking people about the question. The question is, well, the, the speculation is, now we have so many um, children born to the men and Chinese mothers. Where does their loyalty reside? Was what if they all? Of course, if it's the conscription still going on, then what happens when these young men join the the military? And where does their loyalty reside? I've been asking people: Do you think there's a connection between this and uh, and the the, uh, the uh, termination of conscription? I asked the KMT official. I asked uh, um, yeah, two, two, three KMT officials. They just shrug you off, saying, "No, this is nonsense. It's completely irrelevant." But I think that there's a uh, There's a point of this question, and um, interesting contrast is that we only pose this question, we only impose this question on the children born to uh, Chinese mothers, not the children born to the uh, uh, Southeast Asian mothers, or English mothers, or American mothers, or Canadian mothers. It's the only, this kind of question only seems to be legitimate, uh, it's so legitimized to be asked on. Um, the uh, Chinese uh, children born to Chinese mothers. I think this is an actual political issue, more reflecting of how Taiwanese identity has become, rather than really where their identity resides. Of course, that's a that's a, that's a real issue as well. But I think it's interesting this idea about migration being a kind of a national security uh, issue because I have a feeling that doesn't that crop up in your one in the way that um, um, I th or maybe it was in what, something that Isabel wrote about. Um, there was a period when uh, there was this, this kind of discourse on uh, the quality of the offspring of these kind of cross-cultural marriages coming up as a national security issue. Um, I have a feeling that might, was it something that, that one of your pieces that touched upon that? Or, or I, I, don't know, I don't know whether you two wanted to respond. Um, yeah, the national security has been frequently used as an excuse of to legitimize any um, like policies by the government, I think. And uh, about the second generation, the, the uh, most frequently questioned issue is like the. I mean, since um, it is this most more on the marriage immigrant, not Chinese marriage immigrants, like um, they will ask like. And how do you educate your sick, uh, your children if you couldn't even speak Chinese? It's a totally false, false questions. Seems like if you imagine, like if I have a, if I have children here in UK, I mean, will people question me of um, my ability to educate my children because I speak um, not perfect English or not? No. So it's again, it's not again, but it's um, not only political, but I mean, I would just say it's a discrimination 
But it's, it's a, a, one of these really kind of um, quite big questions that we don't really know the answer to. We only, I mean, we've got a couple of chapters to try and look at the children of cross-cultural families. So, for example, one of them looks at things like educational attainment, kind of uh, uh, tendency towards depression or uh, abnormal behaviour. And generally, the trends were did it didn't seem to make any difference. Um, uh, another chapter was doing uh, interviews with the children, I think, of mainland spouses. And I, I know at the time when we had the first conference, it was probably the most controversial um, um, uh, paper, this kind of ethics of doing this kind of uh, interviews with uh, young children. But if we think about the numbers of children uh, in, uh, we're talking about here, but 7.54% of births, I think you, you mentioned. Uh, if we think then, uh, what's going to happen once these people get uh, voting rights? Which way are they going to uh, vote? So I think it's a real, inter a really interesting question for the future of Taiwanese, for example, party politics, electoral uh, studies. Uh, yeah, always, come, always coming back to that, my favourite topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think because of time, we should uh, we should finish here. We've got um, uh, sandwiches, we've got wine, juice. Uh, and we've even got some um, um, uh, some books for sale, some <laughs> um, that, that Hannah is going to be uh, uh, selling. So uh, I think we should uh, uh, thank our, our speakers uh, one more time and then enjoy some some, some wine and some.